So good morning uh, again, and uh, just want to remind you that last week we had the first in a three-part series uh, called Family Matters, and Tara was here and she spoke to us uh, about how it is that we have a responsibility to pass the good news of Jesus Christ on to other generations, especially Generation Z. The topic this morning is uh, family secrets. And next week, uh, our lead pastor, Graham Baird, will be back, uh, and I'll let, you t I'll let him tell you what his topic is. But it has to do with very special, significant other relationships. Anyway, we do uh, pray for you to experience God's presence here. Um, and again, welcome to those of you who are on Facebook. So the sermon on, on, on family secrets, looking through the Bible, I needed to find a text. So the text I came up with was in Matthew 1, and it's the genealogy of Jesus. I know you're excited for me to read to you the entire genealogy of Jesus. I do want you to know that genealogies, including those in the Bible, were intended by their writers not as historical records um, to be deposited in library archives. Their purpose was to conjure up a vision, an image, an impression about that last name in the list to position that person in a generational narrative to establish their significance. As such, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew is like a ballad that a poet um, might have been strumming um, on a lute around a campfire uh, in, in, in ancient times. So this morning, so that your eyes don't glaze over, instead of reading the genealogy, it's going to be sung to you. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac he had Jacob, Jacob he had Judah and his kin. Well, then Perez and Zerah came from Judah's woman Tamar, Perez he brought Hezron up and then came Aram then Amenadab then Nashan who was then the dad of Salmon who with Rahab fathered Boaz. Ruth, she married Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse. Jesse, he had David, who we know as king. David, he had Solomon by dead Uriah's wife. Solomon, well, you all know him. He had good old Rehoboam, followed by Abijah, who had Asa. Asa had Jehoshaphat, had Joram, had Isaiah, who had Jotham, then Ahaz, then Hezekiah. Followed by Manasseh, who had Amon, who was a man, who was father of a good boy named Josiah. Who grandfathered Jehoiakim, who caused the Babylonian captivity, because he was a liar. Then he had Shealtiel, who begat Zerubbabel, who had Abiud, who had Eliakim. Eliakim had Azer, who had Zadok, who had Achim. Achim was the father of Eliab then. He had Eliezer, who had Nathan, who had Jacob. Well, listen very closely, I don't want to sing this twice. Jacob was the father of Joseph, husband of Mary, mother of Christ. I wanted the band to do it, but they didn't think it was going to be used as a scripture too many times. Most families keep family secrets a secret. They're not talked about at family reunions or recorded in the family Bible. That is, unless you are Jesus. The bad apples in his family tree are there in the first chapter of the New Testament for all of us to see. 
Mentioned there is the slippery Jacob, Rahab the harlot, Tamar the widow trickster, David and Bathsheba the adulterous, Jacokin, uh, the one who was responsible for the Babylonian exile. All of their stories can be read in their entirety in the biblical text. So the question is, why didn't Jesus or his followers erase the names of these questionable characters from the list? Why does the Bible air the family's dirty laundry? And why don't we follow that example? This morning, seeking to answer these questions, we're going to explore this topic of family secrets. Let's pray. Gracious God, open our hearts, open our minds to you and to what it is that you have for us this day. Amen. So I want us to begin with a typology of secrets. Uh, some secrets are delightful, so let's be really clever and call them delightful secrets. Delightful secrets are time-limited secrets created for the benefit of someone else with a positive outcome. Delightful secrets often surprise um, as they seek to bring joy uh, when they are revealed. My sophomore year of college, my whole family created and kept a delightful family secret from me until Christmas morning to help me discover uh, the secret, they sent me on a treasure hunt all around the house, following clue after clue, clue, and finally I found the secret, and here it is. It is a Ford um, XL GT. Oh, you don't get to see it? Oh, I'm so sorry, because that was my favorite car in the entire world. It was the first time that I had a car that wasn't shared with my sisters. I didn't have to take the bus any longer back uh, from Davis. Uh, I could drive up and drive back at will. And I loved the car, and I loved the family that gave it to me. Gifts. Surprise parties, unexpected visits are all delightful secrets. And these kinds of secrets are fun to keep, they're, they're fun to share, and any of you that want to create them, uh, for me, feel free. The second kind of, of positive secret is what I'm going to call essential secrets. Essential secrets are developmentally important. These are, for example, the secrets children and adolescents keep to themselves as they grow up. Wise parents know there is an important rhythm to independence and togetherness. A child's essential secrets must be respected because something vitally important is at stake, nothing less than the formation of their person. In our helicopter parenting culture, some parents seem to think that they have a right to know everything about their child, even when their child is an adolescent or an adult. When a daughter believes that she is obligated to tell mom all of her secrets, the mother-daughter relationship remains infantile. Not until a young person can freely choose not to confide in a parent is a real parent-child relationship established. Essential secrets must be under. Uncovering an essential secret without permission or consent can create devastating attachment injuries. It is a violation of trust. So, just one tidbit for the morning, don't read your child's diary. And if you are going to read their texts, make sure you tell them in advance that you have access to those texts. Now, I know I just scared some of you, because there is another category of secret that does need to be shared, whether it is held by a child, an adolescent, or an, an adult. 
These are what I'm going to call dangerous secrets. Dangerous secrets are those that put self or other in physical or in emotional jeopardy. They include plans to commit suicide or violence, drug or alcohol abuse, rape, incense, child neglect, sexual or physical abuse. Dangerous secrets require immediate disclosure and intervention. Dangerous secrets need to be shared for the safety and protection of the vulnerable. If you are told a dangerous secret, get help. Don't keep that dangerous secret to yourself. Don't keep it secret. Every one of us needs to think of ourselves as mandatory reporters. Now back to those children that we love, the teenagers, um, that may not want to tell us any secret, not even the dangerous secrets um, about themselves or their friends. Because of that tendency, it's really important for us to surround our children and adolescents uh, with what I would call supportive adults, aunts and uncles, grandparents, teachers, coaches, youth leaders, they're all important. Teens might find it easier to tell one of them than to tell their parents. I, for instance, after my mother died, I went into a deep depression and I was struggling with suicidal thoughts. I shared those thoughts with the pastor here, Tom Gillespie. I didn't tell my dad, but I chose a great person to tell. Because of Tom Gillespie, I'm standing here today. He literally saved my life. You need to get help if you hear or if you have a dangerous secret. The fourth kind of secret is what we will call shame secrets. Shame secrets are the type of secrets that were revealed in our morning text, in the genealogy of Jesus. A few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal published an article called, Two Sisters Bought DNA Kits. Since I was going to use the genealogy, I decided to read the article. The two sisters, Julie and Frida, took ancestry DNA kit tests back in 2016. That's their, that's their picture, and this is the, the kind of DNA test that they took. Once the results came back, they sat down together to share and to compare. Curiously, one man's name popped up as a close genetic match on Frida's chart. Neither sister had ever heard of him, so Julie looked him up on Facebook, of course, and sure enough, she found his picture, and uh, his picture uh, as a child is, is on the right, and their father's picture is on the left. As they looked at the man's picture, uh, Julie said, you know, he's got to be our brother. They looked at his age, um, and sure enough, he was, and he is. This is a picture of the siblings when they first, when they first met, and you can see uh, some family resemblances. But after they made this discovery um, of their father's secret, right, uh, they, they did the next logical thing, and they tried to figure out why Julie's test didn't show that, that, that she had a genetic connection to this man. This, as it turns out, was mom's secret. Julie was the product of a brief extramarital affair that their mother had had. The man who raised Julie and Frida was Frida's biological father, but he wasn't Julie's biological father. Eventually, with some detective work, uh, Julie found her, her birth father in Florida just in time to celebrate uh, his 90th birthday with him, and that's them on the, on the right celebrating uh, his birthday. On the left is a, a picture of him when he was Casanova. Anyway, it was, it was a happy uh, reunion. Uh, these two shameful family secrets 
had, as you might imagine, a ricocheted effect throughout the family, uh, creating new bonds with people uh, who were once stranger, but also causing some tension within the family, like with their younger brothers who did not want to hear um, or listen to family secrets. Understandably, too, the revelations also sparked discussion and disagreement uh, in the family about the bonds of loyalty and how much their parents should or should not have told them. Julie, who is 65 years old, says uh, she is still grappling with the pain of knowing my life was a lie and having all these questions that can't fully be answered because both my parents are gone. The hardest part, she says, came when she and her sister Frida realized for the first time that they were half-sisters and not full sisters. We held each other, Julie said, and we sobbed. This is their, this is their picture growing up. They were very close sisters. So let me warn you this morning, Direct-to-consumer genetic testing kits are readily available. Family secrets related to ancestry are almost impossible to keep these days. By, 10, by 2021, more than 100 million of these tests are expected to have been taken by people in the United States. A hundred million. I actually innocently gave away two of them at Christmas. Extramarital affairs are not the only shame secrets families keep. There's a whole category of shame secrets uh, kept for fear of judgment of others. We keep secrets about divorce, mental illness, rape, sexually transmitted diseases, adoption, alcoholism, drug addiction, unemployment, marital affairs, of course, homosexuality, gambling, criminal behavior, violation of the incest taboo, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and suicide. That's not the complete list, but it gives you a pretty good idea of the kinds of shame issues that we hide. The problem with hiding our shame has been eloquently explained by research psychologist uh, Brina Brown. She writes, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three things to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. This is significant because research shows that shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, and eating disorders. In other words, shame secrets generate more Shame secrets. So what's the antidote to shame? Well, it's vulnerability in an epithetic context. Here, um, uh, Brina's wise words. Vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity, innovation, and change. Shame drives two big tapes. You're not good enough, and who do you think you are? If you put shame in a Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. I find it absolutely fascinating and wonderful um, that God said something very similar to this to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12:9. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. The Apostle Paul, in light of this word from God, came up with a new uh, game plan saying, So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I absolutely adore it when psychology finally gets the biblical text. So why did Jesus hang out his family's dirty laundry for all to see? 
He did so because our families have some dirty laundry and bad apples too. An uncle with a prison record, an alcoholic dad, a grandparent who ran away with a co-worker. If your family tree is bruised or has bruised fruit on it, Jesus wants you to know mine does too. To those embarrassed or shamed, by their family secret. Jesus whispers through this genealogy, I've been there. But let's not be misled. Every family has a right to privacy. The question of privacy versus secrecy will look different in every family. Hidden birthday presents, private medical diagnoses, and shared family traditions can draw families together cohesively, whereas shame-motivated family secrets tend to create strife and to pull the family apart. When family members suspect that important information is being withheld from them, they may pursue the content of the secret in ways that violate privacy. A mother may read that diary. A husband may rifle through his wife's purse. Relationships corrode with suspicion. Conversely, family members may respond to a secret with silence and distance, affecting areas of life that have nothing to do with the secret. Either way, the secret wedges a boulder between those who know on the one side and those who don't. Molly first called a therapist during what should have been a joyful time. She had just given birth to a bouncing little baby boy. But her happiness was bittersweet because as she was with um, her son, it made her long for a relationship with her brother that she had never had. She hadn't talked to him in six years. The reason reached back 30 years to a secret made by their mother. When Molly, Calvin, and their younger sister Annie were teenagers, the grandmother of the family committed suicide. Molly and Annie were told that she died from a heart attack. Only Calvin, the eldest, knew the truth. Mom made him promise not to tell his sisters. His sisters, however, sensed that there was a mystery going on, and they tried every which way to uh, get mom to engage them in conversation about this, but she'd always switch the topic. Making and keeping secrets became the modus operandi uh, in the family when their aunt committed suicide two years later when Calvin fathered a child out of wedlock those secrets were only held by Calvin and Mom. They were not shared with Molly and Annie. Eventually, Molly discovered that her grandmother had committed suicide. So who did she tell? Only Annie. She never talked to her brother or to um, their mother uh, 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 about it. So what happens in, in, when we hold secrets is a triangulization. Calvin and his mother distanced themselves from the girls um, as the secret triangle was formed. Molly and Annie distanced themselves from Calvin and mom. Uh, eventually, Molly convinced her two siblings because of this need that she had inside to connect with her brother to go into therapy with her. As they did so, they were asked to relive their memories of how it felt to keep and to be kept out of secrets. Molly, Annie, and Calvin all acknowledged that their need to connect with each other had gone painfully unmet because of these secrets. Calvin explained tearfully that being forced to keep information from his sisters resulted in him withdrawing from them and into himself. Molly told about um, how watching her newborn made her so sad that she didn't have this relationship with her brother. 
After one of these therapy sessions, they went to dinner together for the first time in years. And Annie re reported, this was so different from any other family event. Things felt genuine for the first time. When everyone in a family knows the family secrets, triangles don't create barriers between members. So how do we go about revealing family secrets? One word, carefully. The experts have some suggestions. First, pick your moment. Don't do it at a holiday celebration. You don't forever want to be remembered as the person who ruined Easter dinner. Find a time when no big emotional events are happening in the family's life. Don't do it near a birth, a wedding, or right after a funeral. Pick your person, one person. Disclosing a family secret in a big group is usually not a good idea. Start by telling the secret to the one person who is most affected by it. Then allow that person to decide if and when to widen the circle. Three, get some support. If it's a particularly difficult secret or you think the fallout will be really negative, make an appointment with a pastor, a counselor, a therapist to talk about it first. This professional can help you to both sort through your feelings and to put together an action plan. Four, be prepared for repercussions. If you withheld a secret the other person has the right to be hurt and angry. So be ready, prepare, steady yourself for the anger that might come, knowing that in time, with patience and openness, healing can come. Fifth, keep the information close. There is a difference between disclosing a secret to those who should know it and blabbing about it on Facebook. Once a secret is told in a family, it has become private, not public. The church, like a family, can also keep secrets. This weekend, the Vatican is trying to come clean from long-held church secrets, to get their dirty laundry out on the table. It is a difficult process. They need our prayers. For the sake of the victims, which include the nuns, the children, and our Lord Jesus Christ, because of those victims, the church needs to succeed. Tom Gillespie once said, sometimes it feels like I've stopped preaching and started meddling. I'm feeling a little bit like that right now. So let me get back to the text, to the genealogy of Jesus. As we said in the beginning, Matthew's genealogy was never intended for research libraries. He wasn't filing a legal brief for use in a court dispute over an estate. Rather, Matthew composed a poetic type ballad to announce the significance of Jesus as a way of setting up the next chapters in the gospel. His skillfully constructed genealogy is parabolic. Parables, you recall, violate expectations. Let me explain. Similar to conventional genealogies, the genealogy of Jesus at first follows the male line. Those were the blue circles in the video. But then, inexplicably, there were four women. Those were the pink bulbs. The first two of those pink bulbs were Tamar and Rahab. Both are Canaanites. The third is Ruth, a Moabite. The fourth isn't named, but we all know that it was Bathsheba, 
the beautiful Hittite woman whom King David glimpsed on a rooftop, seduced before ordering the murder of her husband. His is the bulb that was taken off of the tree. The first notable expectation violation is that all four of these women are Gentiles. They are not Jews. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself came for the redemption of all people, not just the Jews. The second expectation violation is that all of these women's plot lines involve sexual irregularity, subversion, or deception, the kinds of stories that our family secrets are made of. And don't forget that following chapter 1 of Matthew comes chapter 2, the story of Jesus' birth to a woman found to be pregnant out of wedlock. How the tongues of Nazareth must have been wagging. But God redeems the sordid stories, the family stories of Israel, all of the secrets of Jesus' earthly family. He also redeems the, the family secrets in our families as well. That is the good news of the gospel. The Apostle Paul asks in Romans, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Can our secrets? No, comes the reply. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hear the good news of the gospel. Nothing, not even your most shameful family or personal secret can separate you from the love of God. God knows and loves you, secrets and all. God sent Jesus to die on a cross to free you from both guilt and shame. You are forgiven, you are loved. Seeing and knowing you better than you know yourself, God declares to you, you are my beloved child. God marks you as God's very own and declares you to be capable, worthy, and in, in, of immeasurable value. Amen.